iOS gives us built-in tools for getting data from the internet into our application. And if we combine that with codable support, it becomes possible to convert Swift objects to JSON for sending and receive back JSON to decode into Swift objects. Even better, when the request completes, we can immediately assign data from there into our Swift UI views, causing our UI to update immediately. To demonstrate this, we're going to load some example music JSON data from Apple's own iTunes API, a real API, and we'll show it inside a Swift UI list. Now, Apple's data includes lots of information, but we're going to whittle it down to the absolute most important stuff a result that will store a track ID and its name and the album it belongs to, plus a response that will store our array of results. So many results. So we'll start out with some code. We'll say there's a struct called response, which is codable, and it has a results value, which is an array of result, capital R. Then there's a struct called result, which is codable. This thing will have a track ID, ID, which is an int, and a track name, which is a string, and a collection name, which is a string. That's the layout Apple gives us. One track here, and then a whole array of them in the main response. We can now go ahead and write a simple content view that shows an array of results. We can say, uh, at state, private var results is an array of results. And then uh, we'll say there's a list of our results with ID of backslash dot track ID. One item comes in, then do a V stack with alignment of leading in each row, then text item dot track name in font headline, and then scroll down a little bit, text item dot collection name like that. Uh, font head, dot headline even, there we go, <laughs> much better. That's gonna show nothing at all, which is fine. You know, our results array is empty after all, but this is where our networking call has to happen. We're gonna ask Apple's iTunes API to send us all the songs by Taylor Swift, and then use a JSON decoder to convert the results into an array of result instances. However, doing this means you have to meet two very important Swift keywords, async and await. You can perform billions of operations per second on any iPhone that can run SwiftUI. These things are extraordinarily powerful, right? It, they're, they're, they're so fast, they complete your work before you even realize they started it. They're just astonishingly fast. On the flip side, any work with a network, particularly the internet, can take several hundred milliseconds to complete. And that is like a, an ice age to a computer that does billions of things per second, per core. I mean, these are massive machines, right? And so rather than telling our program, hey, listen, um, you've got to stop while the networking happens. Sorry, just, just freeze up. Swift gives us the ability to say, this work will take some time to run. So please wait for it to complete. But in the meantime, go ahead and carry on running the app as usual elsewhere. Just go ahead and let this thing go to sleep for a while. This functionality, which is very popular with dogs it turns out. Oh, you're tired, too many treats, huh? And this functionality, which is the ability to leave some code running over here while our main app carries on working, is called an asynchronous function an asynchronous function. A synchronous function, without the asynchronous, a synchronous function is one that runs fully from start to finish before returning a value as needed to wherever it was called from. But an asynchronous function is one that is able to, if it wants to, go to sleep for a while. So it can wait for some other work to complete before continuing. Now in our case, that means our function can go to sleep for a while as our networking happens. We connect to Apple's iTunes API, make our search, get the results, download the results, yada, yada, yada. So the rest of our app doesn't just freeze up for several seconds, right? To make this easier to understand, we're gonna write in a few stages. 
First, a basic method stub. Just the name of the method plus the new keyword. Funk, load data, async. Notice the new async keyword here. We're telling Swift this load data method here might want to go to sleep in order to complete its work. We want that thing to run as soon as our list is shown, but we can't use the onAppear modifier you've seen previously. That does not understand how to handle sleeping functions. It expects its function to always be synchronous. SwiftUI provides a different modifier here for these kinds of tasks, helpfully called task. Uh, and this can call functions that can go to sleep. It understands, start the task, come back to it later. All Swift asks us to do is to mark those functions that might sleep with the other keyword, await. So we're explicitly acknowledging this code might go to sleep. So go ahead and add this modifier to the list now. Dot task, load data. And that won't work because we need to acknowledge it might sleep. We have to say await. Oh, and that's required, just like using try is required when calling a throwing function. Swift knows the throwing function, Swift knows it might throw an error. We're saying try, so we're acknowledging it might throw an error. We're acknowledging code below might not be run if an error is thrown, right? We're acknowledging that at this point, our program might go to sleep for a long period of time. It might take a second, might take a minute to run. What happens here on line 33 could take place 10 minutes later. We don't know. Our program state could have changed. So we're acknowledging to ourselves and to Swift and to other programmers, it might go to sleep here. Now inside load data, we have three steps we've got to try and complete. Step one is to create the URL we want to read. Step two is to fetch data for a URL. And step three is to decode the result of that data into our response struct we designed earlier. We're going to add these step by step, starting with a URL. We're going to have a precise format, which is itunes.apple.com, followed by a series of parameters that exactly match Apple's syntax. You can find the full set online. Just do a web search for iTunes search API, and you'll find that here. In our case, we're going to search for the string Taylor Swift and the entity song, songs by Taylor Swift. So we'll say, guard let our URL equals a URL with a string, HTTPS, colon slash slash, itunes.apple.com, slash search. And here's the parameters, question mark, term equals Taylor plus Swift, plus the space in URLs, ampersand entity equals song. That's how you structure searches for Apple's API here. So we're saying, get that exact URL, Taylor plus Swift and N equals song. If that fails, if for some reason that URL is bad, else print invalid uh, URL and then return. Now to be clear, what we're saying is if we've failed to convert this string into a URL, print a message and exit. That will never fail. We have hand typed the URL here. It cannot go wrong. There's no chance it can go wrong. It's all been hard coded by us. Yes, if you've made a mistake with the URL and you're typing, then it will fail. But that's a logic error. That's a you problem. You want to use uh, more care when typing, quite frankly. You don't want to try and handle typing errors at runtime. I've left it here as guard let URL because you might decide to upgrade this to support like custom parameters passed in as a string and they might go wrong. They aren't hard coded anymore, they're strings being passed in, so you gotta be careful with those. Is that right? Yeah, you love it. Okay, step two is to fetch data from that URL, which is where our sleep is likely to happen. Now I say likely because it might not. iOS will do a little bit of caching on our behalf automatically. So if the URL is fetched twice, back to back, the data the second time will be sent straight back, rather than triggering a sleep. Regardless, a sleep is still possible here. And every time a sleep is possible, we've got to use the await keyword with the code we want to run. 
Just as importantly, an error might also be thrown here. Maybe the uh, user isn't currently connected to the internet, for example. So we're going to use both try and await at the same time. So we'll say as a do block with let data underscore equals try await URL session dot shared dot data from that URL. And then more code to come. And we'll catch any errors that happen and print out invalid data. Okay. That's all our code. Um, just in that tiny slice of code, we've managed to introduce three important things. It's that few lines of code. Um, our work is being done by this data from URL method, which takes a URL and returns a data instance containing whatever it found there. This belongs to the URL session dot shared uh, type. URL session is a class and it's one you can create and configure with custom URL options if you want to for the way you handle data. But if you want to, you can say, just give me the shared one that's already been made. For basic requests like ours, just use a shared one again, again, again. No custom configuration required. That's set one. Second one is the return value from URL is going to be a tuple containing the data at the URL plus any metadata describing it, how the request went, how big it was and so forth. Now we don't use the metadata here, but we do want the data that came back. And so we say, make a new local constant called data and then toss away the metadata. We don't care, it's underscore, ignore the metadata, but we do put the data itself into a new local constant. And third, when we want to use try and await at the same time, we must write try await. Await try, like this, is not allowed. It will complain at you. Right now you can see it's saying, don't do that. <laughs> uh, you must do this, fine. It doesn't matter, right? I mean, it, it, there's no particular reason why await try is bad and try await is good, other than that's the way it was chosen to be. They had to pick one for consistency's sake, right? That's the way they're going to do it. I think try await just rolls off the tongue more clearly than await try. Anyway, if this succeeded without errors, then our data constant will be set to whatever data came back from the URL. But if it fails for any reason, no internet, whatever, then it jumps straight through to our print call here saying invalid data. The last step of this code is convert our data object into a response object using JSON decoder. Then assign the array inside that. If you remember our response has an array inside of results, assign that array to our results array here. They're both array of results. This is exactly what we've used before, so it shouldn't come much of a surprise. Uh, let's go ahead and put it in here. If let decoded response equals try question mark, JSON decoder dot decode response dot self from our data, then our results equals decoded response dot results. Like that. That's our code. That's it. I press Command R to build and run. Let's see how it looks. Let's see how it looks. All being well, we should see a list of Taylor Swift songs appearing after a short pause. When it finishes launching the simulator, that is. Come on, you can do it. Almost there. It's connected to the thing at least. Oh, that's appeared. Good sign. There we go. So a whole bunch of Taylor Swift songs came back from that. Honestly, it's not really that much code, right? This is mostly converting the URL safely. Um, how well the end result, result works, even reloading the UI, I think is really nice. Now, all this only handles downloading data. Later on in this project, we're going to look at how to ad adapt this code a little bit to have a slightly different approach. So you can send codable data, but that's enough for now.